This is the Intro to Photoshop module, Beginner for Photoshop Tutorials. This is going to cover a whole beginner set of modules covering the basics of Photoshop. Now the first thing that you're going to want to do in Photoshop is open a new image file. But I'm going to go over each tool and panel, but first we must properly set up Photoshop for best use so you can be successful. Now you can skip this module, but you're going to miss out on some very important information and um, I want to basically explain to you as I've been listening to a lot of my users um, complain about Photoshop or that Photoshop crashes or it has problems and all of these issues um, derive from one thing and that is because you don't have the proper equipment the proper setup and you don't have Photoshop set up from the beginning the proper way and what this module is going to cover, it's going to cover a lot of the essentials that you need to be successful. Now basically, if I had to do everything all over again, I'd really want someone, you know, who was an authority figure in the field to go ahead and tell me these things. But these are the kind of things that I figured out on my own, even after going through college and, you know, becoming an expert in my field, these were things that were not told to me. These were things that I had to learn the hard way. So I, I haven't found a course like this at all whatsoever on the internet. And I do notice that a lot of people are giving out, um, you know, information who are not qualified as an expert in Photoshop. And I really hope to change that so that way you guys can be successful in learning Photoshop. So let's get to it. So in order to access these courses, you're going to go to YouTube slash PhotoHackLovers. You're going to click on Playlists. And from the playlist, you're, you can see all of the playlists that have been created here. The first playlist, and there's going to be videos added weekly until we build up the intro first. We're going to do the Intro to Photoshop, Beginner Photoshop Tutorials. Then we're going to do the Intermediate then the advanced and then the expert and so on. So in the uh, expert and advanced, uh, we're gonna be doing some really cool composites. So this is definitely something that you should, you know, subscribe to. So what you're gonna do is you're going to click on the video and I'll go back and show you again. You're just going to click play all in the playlist and all of the playlists are going to show up here on the right side and they'll automatically play one after the other. In order to become subscribed so you can get notifications of the new videos, you're going to click subscribe, you're going to hit the bell, you're going to click all, and you're going to press OK at the top. And then you'll be subscribed to the videos so each time a new video comes back out in this series, you will have the first notification to it. Um, all of the resources are going to be free in this video, so you're going to get brushes, actions, all kinds of cool stuff, so please subscribe. So let's now begin by going over the course outline, uh, the introduction to Photoshop and course outline about this course. This is going to be the preface and intro to this course, and you're going to meet the instructor, me. We're gonna see a whole bunch of information about me, uh, why I'm qualified to teach this course, and the materials needed and set up and how to load the software will be covered in this module. So first things first, um, we're going to do five steps in this module. Introduction, system requirements, software, setting up Photoshop, and then troubleshooting. All the things that you need to be successful in Photoshop. Uh, just like a, a video game, if you if you start a video game and you don't have the system requirements, if you don't have the tools necessary to run a program or build an application, you're going to fail. So this is very important. It's crucial. And I don't see anybody else online providing these tools and tips. So this is essential to getting started. So um, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to meet me. I'm Charlotte Salcedo. I'm a Photoshop guru. A little bit about me and some background. I am of mixed descent of Latin America and Irish. Um, actually, my ancestors came from Cuba. 
So I am a Cuban American and I love spicy food, really spicy anything. So I don't really have a favorite food. I just love spicy food. Uh, I am a, what you call an older millennial, not necessarily a boomer, but I am an older millennial. I kind of, I kind of, um, started going to college when, uh, Photoshop, um, was just born. So I actually started using Photoshop from the beginning. So I've been using Photoshop from the very first application. Um, so it's come a long way. And I have been through each different um, version of Photoshop and I've been using Photoshop for over 20 years. So I am an expert in Photoshop. There's pretty much nothing that I don't know about Photoshop. Um, Photoshop is kind of like my baby. I, when I went to college, I really didn't like any of the other programs. I was absolutely fascinated with Photoshop because in the traditional sense, growing up poor, art supplies, good quality art si supplies, and you can't really be a good artist unless you have good quality art supplies. And because art supplies were so costly, getting a copy of Photoshop seemed more economical. And it's also very forgiving if you make mistakes and whatnot. So, um, you know, so I subscribe to the cloud for like 1999 a month. I get all the programs and I'm able to use that. And I started a business um, from zero to making, uh, currently right now in my third year, I'm making about 30K a year. Uh, that's probably not a lot of money, but I think it's a realistic expectation based on the fact that when I started out, I was working a job and at the same time doing this, you know, full time. And just in this past year, um, I started to do it full time. And the more time that you have, the more money that you can make with a program like this. So uh, this program has um, allowed me to become an entrepreneur and basically you know, um, flourish as a designer. It's taught me so many things. And what I can say is from experience, practice, practice, practice makes perfect. If you're not willing or passionate to get into this, then you should stop right here because you're going to have to practice a lot, watch a lot of videos, especially the tutorials that I'm providing for free um, to help you get through it. So that's a little bit about me. I have a, a lot of experience in the field. I've worked for some many major companies, you know, just to name a few. Wacom, Art Rage, Adobe, and Suitcase, Fu Suitcase Fusion. And I've been featured in Wired Magazine and Smashing Magazine. Enough about me. So let's talk about how Photoshop needs a very powerful system in order to run. Many new Photoshop users struggle and get frustrated because they don't have the proper system or tools in the beginning, like I said before, and not having the right monitor, computer system, or drawing tablet can really be a hindrance to new users. Many simply are unaware of this issue and give up and blame the issue on Adobe software. So what we're going to do is we're going to look and shop for proper devices that you will need in order to run Photoshop. So what I've done is I went on Amazon and I pulled up some specs for some computers that I might think that would be beneficial. Now, personally, I have a custom built PC. Um, that's definitely probably the way to go, but most people aren't able to put together a PC together themselves or get a hold of somebody who can. So I'm going to go over these specs. So, and and this particular um, slot right here, I really like these specs here um, for this particular tower. But there's some things that I want to go over here. Now, 32 gig of memory is 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 going to be um, crucial because Photoshop is a memory hog. So uh, if you're going to be doing video edits or any type of 3D, um, you're going to want to get the 32 gigabyte. If you're not going to be doing video edits or you're not going to be doing 3D, you could get away with either 16 or possibly 12. But because um, you want to grow with your system, you always want to get a little bit more than what you need. 
because you never know when Photoshop is going to update. Each time they update, it requires more system requirements. I know that with each version, I've had to actually upgrade my computer every three years because of Adobe's stringent system requirements. So um, another thing is the Intel i Core i7. Um, I do believe they have the i9 um, at this point. Um, you could get away with the i7. I currently have the i7. So, um, you know, but if you want to scale upwards, if I were to buy a computer today, I'd probably get the i9. Now, um, the CPU speed, 4.60 is pretty good. Um, I think that's as fast as you can get. I'm not sure if there is something higher than that, but 4.60 is great. I currently am running um, a 3.68, so a 4.60 is really fast. Now, the graphics processor, this is the NVIDIA G GeForce GTX. I'm gonna say that I would, I would recommend, um, it doesn't really say what you get here, but I actually looked it up, it's four gigs. I actually recommend the eight gig, and I actually recommend the 960 or above for the graphics card. And then um, as far as the, um, the graphics it should be dedicated and as far as the hard disk space I noticed that a lot of these specs they're kind of like randomly all over the place well, what you're gonna want to do is you're gonna want to get a computer with all the specs that you need in one row so this one has the memory it has the core it has the CPU speed it doesn't have the graphics card I would say that Dell computers are really lacking in graphics cards so I wouldn't recommend getting a Dell if you're going to be doing graphics. Um, then there's the, the storage space. Now this one has the, sport, the storage space that you will be needing. You're gonna need something between uh, two terabytes. I would say that will be good enough, but like I said, if I was gonna be buying a computer today, I'd probably get four gig. And then for graphics, you have to store photos and stuff like that. I would also get an external hard drive that you can hook up to the USB port. And so um, those are the specs that you need. Now, if you're going to be getting a PC, I do not recommend Windows 10 Home or just basic Windows. I recommend the Windows Pro or the Professional simply because the fact that Windows 10 Home and Windows is garbage. And it tends to update a lot of times um, with the Windows 10 Pro and the Windows 10 Professional, um, you can choose when your updates will take place, whereas the regular Windows and the basic Windows, it will update automatically. A lot of the times Windows, it has like these really crazy updates that will screw up your computer. I noticed that the latest update, it started automatically deleting files and it really broke and crashed some people's systems. You can Google that about Windows recent update in April. It literally was a killer. I actually lost a lot of files because I mistakenly saved them to the desktop. You never want to save any of your files to the desktop. You always want to save them on an external hard drive. So, um, or somewhere outside of your computer. So in case it does crash or something happens, you'll always have your files ready. Um, some people like to store them in the cloud. I personally don't like to pay monthly fees every month. So unless you are running a design business and you want to um, store your files outside so you can sell them, that's different. But, um, you know, the, uh, the storages, the external storages for the USB will work just as good. Um, I actually recommend replacing them every three years. Um, with technology, they don't make it like they used to. So what you could do is you could just go online and sell your old storages um, on eBay or Amazon after they've expired for three years and then just buy new ones and then transfer all the data before you sell them. Um, so that way you're, you don't, you don't like keep your drive forever and then it ends up breaking down. And so, I mean, that's what I do and I recycle my drives. Um, so that way they don't crash on me. The next thing is your monitor. So, um, 
this monitor, if you don't see this picture for this model, because I noticed that a lot of sellers are selling this particular model, but it's not the same model. This is the exact model that I have. Um, and the great thing about this model is that it comes with, and I don't think that you can see them here, but it, yeah, right there. It comes with four USB ports on each side of the monitors. So, and you can, you can um, hook these two monitors together. Now, the drawback of this monitor is that you cannot hook up three monitors to this monitor. But I'll tell you something about this monitor. It's $169.95. It is the most economical monitor. Um, it's about 24 inches. Um, so it's perfect for your desk. It's not too big. It's not too small. But the great thing about this is that it comes pre-calibrated. Now, if you calibrate a monitor, it can be very expensive, very confusing, and very difficult. So why make your life more complicated? Um, and what I mean by pre-calibrated, and you probably don't understand that word if you're new to Photoshop or design, let me explain. Okay, so have you ever were designing something online or you saw a picture online and then you printed it out and the colors were just not the same? So basically what there, what this monitor d does is that there is a difference between the CMYK and the RGB colors, but what it does, it creates a profile. It's kind of like a, like a Adobe RGB profile, an ICC profile. And what it does is it creates this profile where it matches the colors up. So what you see on your monitor is what you get printed out. And you won't be able to function without a monitor like this because if you get just like a regular everyday shindig monitor, your colors are gonna be all messed up. Whenever you do proofs and edits and you send them to a client, you you probably look like a really good skin tone on your monitor, but then when you send it to the client, it looks really orange or it doesn't look right. So you definitely want a monitor that comes pre-calibrated with the colors, um, otherwise, you might as well not even try because when I first started out, I made this mistake. I actually had a client who really laughed at me really hard because she was using a Mac and I was using a really crappy monitor. And when I did her photo edits, even though on my computer screen, it looked legit, it looked nice. When she received it, it was like a bright pumpkin orange. So definitely this is the most economical monitor that you can get for the price point. And I will go into a video more about colors and monitors and DPI and all of that stuff in detail. I'm gonna do a master course on print. Um, so that's coming soon. But I just wanted to basically give you an example as to why. Now this monitor, it can go up and down so you can move it sideways and stuff like that. It makes it really good for editing. It's very versatile. I've had these monitors for several years. Another thing I wanted to explain to you, when you have a monitor, and I've worked in technical support for uh, Vizio and for different um, you know, companies, Apple and different stuff like that, and there are lights inside the monitors and they do have a shelf life. You know how like you have a, a lamp or something like that and you have to replace the light bulb? Well, these monitors don't last forever. The lights in them will eventually go out. So after, I believe, when I was working with technical support for like any TV or electronic device that you buy, the shelf life is between five to seven years. So after five to seven years, those monitors or um, TVs or anything that you buy probably won't work anymore. And if they do, they'll probably, you know, start to go out because the lights in there, they do have an expiration date. They never tell you that, but because I worked in technical support, this is one of the things that I learned working for Vizio and working for different companies, you know, um, providing technical support. I wanted to learn as much as I could about computers, so I actually went and worked for a lot of companies learning more about electronic devices, how they work, you know, how to set them up and everything like that, you know, so. Um, I'm just sharing this knowledge with you. So once you reach about the, the fourth or fifth year, you wanna sell your monitor and get new ones, always. Um, and um, 
Another thing is like technology, every three to four years, it does upgrade. So it's definitely beneficial to upgrade your system every three to four years. Um, you could get away with doing it every five years, but I mean, it's, it's very essential to do this. And I'm just giving you this knowledge and passing it on to you because this is what I've learned uh, along the way. So um, let's move on to the next. This is definitely optional, um, but the Epson Perfection V19, and they have other models out, um, but the only difference between this one, this one, and this one is that it has cloud, but I don't think you really need that if you're scanning in your files. You don't really need that particular software. So, um, you know, you it says you can scan over oversized documents, scan and st stitch software, but I mean, you you can scan oversized documents as well with um, with this particular model. I mean, this one is actually like $40 cheaper. You could get the upgraded version. But what this does is that you can scan in photos at 4,800 DPI. So uh, essentially a regular photo is about 300 uh, DPI. So that's a really, really high resolution. And so like if you have, um, like say for instance, I, when I make digital art or I make, um, what do you say, um, watercolor brush strokes or anything that I make where I have done some type of artistic thing and then I scan them in using the Epson. Um, and I've used a lot of scanners and this one is the only one that's like really, really good. Now they don't have a lot of tutorials on this. And when I first started out, I actually had to contact technical support because it's very difficult, the inter interface, how to use. So. I'm actually going to make a video tutorial on how to use the Epson, um, how I use the Epson, how to set up the colors and everything like that so you'll be successful with this. But like I said, this is optional if you want to scan in your art. This is a really cool um, thing to have and getting the right kind of scanner is also key because you know, not every product is created equal. There are some scanners that are more expensive and they're crap, but I find this one to be the best one on the market. And it's as far as like a budget scanner, you know, for, you know, that's not really expensive because I'm not rich, you know what I mean? You're gonna need a really good mouse. A lot of people don't understand that a, a mouse is definitely something that you need that is really good. And this one has um, a DPI up to 2400 and you can change the DPI on here. And this basically makes it where you can zoom in to the highest levels. This is a mouse that I own and it's actually made for a laptop and gamer, but this is really good for graphic design. And I use this, it's, very, it's a very, very, very good mouse. You're gonna need a very good mouse because this is you're gonna be using it nonstop. So um, yeah, so I highly recommend this, and um, you can um, you know get whatever mouse you want, but I definitely recommend this mouse. It has a lot of cool features, and it also glows and changes color too, which is not bad. That's not why I bought this. I bought it because of uh, its its uh, adjustable DPI and able to to zoom and how how breathable it is how easy and versatile it is so there's two other options that you can do this is a Wacom a Wacom CTL 4100 into its graphics drawing tablet and it also includes three bonus softwares for only $79.95 now I would definitely get the medium and I think the medium is $199.95 but why get that when you can just get the Intuos Pro, and that's what I have. So let me go ahead and show you. Now, I personally have the Intuos Pro, um, the older model, which doesn't work with the newer pens. So I wanted to get the 3D pen, and I noticed that my older Intuos Pro didn't work with the the newer, newer pen model. So I got the new Intuos Pro paper, and it's a little bit more costly, but if you're on a budget, you can get um, a refurbed Wacom Intuos Pro S, and this is what I started out with. I started out with a refurbished 
um, Wacom and they're just as good. I wouldn't get a refurb off of Amazon, but I definitely, you can get them off of Wacom and they come with a warranty, a one year warranty. You can buy an extended warranty as well. Now the great thing about Cintiq, they have a program and you don't even have to have like super good credit. You can have decent credit. They offer payment plans and payment options. And so that's how I got the Intuos Pro paper. Like I said, I'm not rich. Um, there's different ways of, of getting things <laughs> that you need. Now, the the Wacom Pro, Intuos Pro is, I wouldn't get any other graphics tablet. Um, I, I wouldn't get the ones that you draw on directly um, because they'll never come close to the actual tablet. So um, it takes some getting used to, but once you get the hang of it, you'll love it. <laughs> you'll absolutely love it. But these types where you draw on the screen, I don't recommend these. If you look on YouTube, the reviews, a lot of people who have these, they don't recommend them. Um, it's, it's better to have it on the desktop because you have access to all your computers, all your computer software and all your files. I also have the Apple iPad Pro, which I don't really enjoy using because it's not connected to my desktop and it's such a pain in the butt to drag files back and forth. And then also I actually prefer the, the Wacom pen over the Apple pen. Um, it's just such a, a, a much better system. And so if you're gonna be working in Photoshop, I personally don't use Photoshop for the, the iPad or the tablet because it's just not there yet. It's just in its infancy. They just came out with the Photoshop um, tablet version. I haven't even I haven't even touched it because people have complained about it so much and I just don't feel that it's ready yet. And so I'm kind of waiting n until next year to start working in it and do tutorials on it before you know you get all the bugs out. But the easiest way to use Photoshop is on the desktop, not on the tablet. So um, you're gonna find a, a whole lot easier to use the Wacom um, stylus pen. So if you go over to um, special offers, you're gonna find many discounts. Um, they have student pricing that you can also take advantage of, and they also have a lot of things that are on sale. And I'm gonna leave a link in the description of the Wacom that I have, and also the pens that I bought. I have the um, Wacom Intuos Pro Note, and then I the, the paper edition, I'm sorry, not note, but the paper edition. And then I also have the um, art pen. So they also have like um, special pens, and I am wanting to get the 3D pen as well, but um, not as of yet. I'm still working with the art pen, and I really love the art pen. It's very, very nice. So you're definitely gonna need that. And then, um, then uh, I'm gonna do a video on setting up your Wacom uh, tablet. So, um, and then I'm also going to do a review of my new uh, tablet that I received so you could see you know, how that is with the, uh, the Intuos Pro Paper. Um, not a whole lot of reviews on that as far as, I know some people are using it, but I don't think that they are using it for uh, Photoshop or whatnot. I don't see a lot of reviews about the art pens either. Um, one of the things is, is with these any of these new tablets, you cannot use the older pens. So if you want to use the new pens, like the new art pen, the new 3D pen, and you have an old Wacom, um, you're gonna need to upgrade. You can also contact Wacom support and you can check to see if your version is compatible with the new pens. That's what I did and I found out that mine wasn't. So um, with that being said, um, Let's move on to the next. So now we're gonna go over uh, the software, how to install, load, and open Photoshop. So basically what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna want to subscribe to the Creative Cloud. Uh, once you subscribe to the Creative Cloud, you're going to have the downloads where you're able to download the uh, software 
into basically kind of like your cloud interface and I'll go ahead and show you that. Okay, so once you download your programs, you have to pay for it, of course. You can get a student subscription um, for Photoshop. I believe it's $9.99. You don't have to actually be in school. You just need a email address that has a .edu. You can be a teacher or student. You can use your kids, um, you know, student, whatever. It doesn't matter, um, you can get a discount for being a student or you can contact them and get a discount too. What I do is every year I contact them and I ask them for a discount and I get the Creative Cloud for $19.99. I think normally it's like $56 a month. So $19.99 is not bad given the fact that you get a lot of resources and I'm gonna show you those here in a minute. So you just bring up Adobe Creative Cloud and you can look at all your apps. And this is not gonna say open, it's gonna say download once you download the Creative Cloud, and then you're going to be able to download. And then if it needs an update, you're able to update it. Now, the great thing about having the cloud is that you have all the mobile applications for free, and you have all of these desktop applications, and then you also have web. You get Spark, which is kind of like Adobe's version of Canva, and, uh, it's really cool about that is that recently um, Adobe Spark acquired some of the licensings to my graphics. So when you you know get the Adobe Creative Cloud and you go on to Spark, you're going to see some of my designs. How cool is that? So um, this you get all of this stuff, and once you download it, and then you just double click the application to start it. So um, let's go ahead and look at all the cool things that you get with Photoshop. So in my previous video, I talked about um, Creative Market and how Kyle Webster got picked up by Creative Market. And I was basically, you know, explaining why you should get on Creative Market, why you should sell your design assets, because eventually, you know, being on Creative Market can lend you um, the eyes of some pretty high up people. So um, Kyle used to sell his brushes on Creative Market. He got it pick, picked up by Adobe. So now you can get all of his brushes, every single one of them for free when you sign up for the Creative Cloud and Photoshop. And there's tons of cool stuff. In this course, we're gonna go over all these brushes. They're so much fun. And these, he's one of the best. Actually, I think he is the best brush creator. Uh, I don't know anyone who's a really good brush creator besides myself, but he's really, really good at, at um, brush creating and he's really an ins truly an inspiration so you will get all of his brushes and the great part about it is that they do um, updates so he releases new updates so he has these new spring 2020 brushes and then you can just download them and update so you have all of these access to all of these resources and then you can also go into the application of the creative cloud and then you can um, learn more you can get more assets they also provide tutorials and then you can get extra resources um, as well so that's a whole lot of fun so another cool thing by being subscribed to the cloud is that you have access to the exchange so if you go to exchange.adobe.com and you're logged into your creative cloud there's tons of things that you can add to photoshop um, at tons of free resources. There are also some paid resources. And um, so a lot of fun stuff. I played around with the QR Code Maker Pro. That is really fun. Um, there's all kinds of cool things in here. Um, so many fun things to play with. Uh, so this is a whole lot of fun. And they have extensions that you can add all in here for free. Now, I particularly some of the the free stuff um it's all right but you can get more advanced um extensions by going to creativemarket.com and searching for the the extensions and add-ons for adobe photoshop i particularly have never purchased anything in here and um some of this stuff is old and not really updated um but that you also find some really cool things to make Photoshop a little bit easier. So um, 
a lot of fun stuff here. So um, a lot of this stuff at the top is paid for, so you have to pay for it, but you can find some free stuff in here as well. All right, so let's go ahead and open up Photoshop. So now that you've downloaded Photoshop, um, what you're gonna wanna do is you can either load it from the Creative Cloud. You can go into here, into Photography, and load it here, or you can simply double click on the icon on your desktop or wherever you have it located on the PC. And it will take a few minutes to load up um, so if you have a pretty fast system, the, you know, the higher specs your computer is, the faster it will load. So that's one of the important things that I went over about having the proper system requirements. So that took like less than 30 seconds to load. Um, so as you see here in this interface, you're going to be a little bit overwhelmed with everything. Um, don't mind. These are all my recent documents that I have been working on. So that is what you will see here. If you have, um, if you're working on a document and you close the document before you close Photoshop, you won't see this dialog box. And let me explain what I mean. I'm going to create a new document, file, new. And there's different types of dimensions that you can put in here. Um, you have um, photo and web. So with photo, uh, you're going to be working with inches. And with web, you're going to be working with pixels. Okay, so the resolution for web is usually 72. And the resolution for photo is 300. Now, you want to keep this, I've noticed that some people have been putting it at 16 bit. One thing that I want to mention with 16-bit, some actions, and you can't use filters with 16-bit, so keep that in mind. So I would start out with 8-bit, and then you can always change it to 16-bit, or you can work in RGB and then convert it to CMYK later. Um, highly recommendable. So remember when I told you about the color profiles earlier about the monitors? So this is the cool thing here. You're gonna to wanna to choose Adobe RGB 1998, and this will basically um, keep your document in the proper color format for Adobe, so that way when you print it out, it prints out the proper color um, profiles. So um, I'm just gonna be working with a web document for now. Um, I'm going to just put 3,000 by 3,000, which literally translates to 10 by 10 inches. So I have this set up in a very peculiar way because I create lots of textures. So mine's already um, set up for artboards. We're not going to be working with artboards now. So I'm just going to convert this to a smart object and rasterize it. So here's what I'm going to, to show you what I mean when if you want to uh, bring that that menu interface back the main interface that I was talking about so we're creating a document here and I'm just going to show you what I mean I'm just going to make a quick document here I got my tools panel out and you can get your tools by going to window uh, tools okay because a lot of people they've asked me well, Charlotte, my, my my interface, the beginning interface disappeared. So we're just gonna save that. Um, <laughs> no rhyme or reason. Now we're gonna close this out. And then when we open Photoshop back up, we're not gonna see that interface. So if you wanna go back out to that interface, you're gonna have to close the document. And so therefore, I'm going to move my tools here so you'll get back to this interface because sometimes people will close out this infer interface and can't get back. So there's a lot of cool things on this particular um, main interface. You can update your system. 
you can create a new document, you can open an old document, you can look at your cloud documents, um, check out your work, and you can learn. So you can go learn Photoshop and they have all of these video tutorials inside Photoshop where you can brush up on skills. I find these tutorials to be really boring and lacking in any type of substance. So, I mean, if you want to watch those videos, be my guest. Um, but I really, I really have never watched and learned anything from Adobe um, video tutorials. I find they're really poorly made and I find that the best tutorials are actually from other users such as myself who have experience in the field. Um, these are kind of robotic and very boring and they don't really give you uh, a vast knowledge. They basically make you want to fall asleep. So before you go into Photoshop, remember I had explained that we need to set up Photoshop the proper way. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go to Edit Preferences. And from here, you're going to go to General. And this is going to pop up uh, everything that you need to be working with. And we're going to just go through here so we can set this up properly. So you want your color picker to be Adobe, not Windows, because you don't want those Windows colors. Um, you can pick the Hue Strip. And you have all of these different options and one of the things that I want to mention to you if you have a problem with Photoshop and it's not working right um, what you're gonna want to do is you're gonna reset preferences on quit and this will basically reset Photoshop so that's probably we're skipping to a troubleshooting um, tip but because we're in here, we have to do the troubleshooting because mainly all of the things that you will need to troubleshoot Photoshop will be in this particular um, preference panel. So let's move on to the next one. Now, um, with the new version of Photoshop, it does something really funny with the free transform tool, and I will show you that in a later video. But I like the legacy free transform, so I have this checked but you can, I mean, that is totally optional. Um, auto show the home screen. So this is the home screen. So when you load Photoshop, you can choose whether or not to show that, or you can just dive right into Photoshop. Most expert users don't um, come to this screen. We actually have that checked off, but I checked it so I could show you this new interface screen. So if you ever lose your home screen and you want to get back to the screen, you can just click that box. I know I had mentioned that before, but they moved everything around because they just updated Photoshop. So this is an, actually a new option. Now moving on to the interface, you can change the colors to dark, light. Um, I would not change it to light, light. I actually like it in between a gray and a dark, but um, I don't know. Um, sometimes the, the screen can really hurt your eyes so you can work in a dark mode, but sometimes I feel like I can't see um, certain things, so I always have it on the mid-level. Um, you, can, you can choose um, different um, standard screen modes. Um, you can change the the menus here, all of these settings are basically um, optional. These are all like cosmetic. So these aren't really necessary. This is all to preference. Um, so your workspace. So let's talk about the workspace. So these are just options about the actual panels, but we're going to get into actual workspaces after this and setting up your actual workspace. But these I would definitely check because um, you want to have large tabs. You want to enable floating documents. And, and enabling the floated, floating documents allows you to drag around your documents all across the, um, the, um, the screen, so to speak. And so I have two screens, so I'm definitely dragging stuff to the other screen so I can see my work on the main screen. So it really helps out a lot. 
Now your tools, so let's go over this. So I would definitely check these boxes when you're, stand, you're first starting out, especially show tooltips, because when you hover over anything in Photoshop, it's going to give you a hint on how to use that particular file and then also to show rich tooltips. And all of the other settings I don't think are necessary. You don't want to enable gestures because you're working on a desktop. Those are specifically for tablet. The history log, you can choose the history log and you can choose how it's saved and whatnot. I, would, I don't really mess with that. I leave it to the default settings. File handling. This is um, pretty important. <laughs> so this has a lot to do with working with Adobe Camera Raw and then also PSD and PSB compression files. Now I really, really wish that um, we could do the course on the, f the, um, the print and file go over all of the print and file extensions because I feel like it's really hard to explain this without you knowing what it means. So I'm going to release that course ASAP and I'm going to put that in the beginner course too. So it's going to be all about file extensions and whatnot so you will understand what we're talking about. So basically um, you want to disable compression of PSD and PSB files because if if your files get compressed it loses quality and um, when you lose quality it's going to look a lot worse in print or however you're doing you're saving your files it's going to reduce the quality of that file and so um, you want to have that checked and you want to maximize PSD and PS file compatibility always now if you're running into a mem a memory or a um, storage issue then you can check that off but if you're working with your PSD files and you want them to be high quality you want to have that checked um, you also um, this is optional if you're working with Adobe camera raw files and you want to convert them from 32 to 16 bit you want to use that in Adobe camera raw and then um, saving your documents so if you're lazy like me and you don't you're just working and you're working away and you forget to save, um, this will tell Photoshop to save your document every 10 minutes. Now, unfortunately, Adobe doesn't crash a lot on me, but sometimes shit happens and it will crash. And in order to like not lose all of your work, um, you wanna have that checked. And I mean, I don't think Adobe's gonna crash. I don't think you will get a lot done in 10 minutes. So I think 10 minutes is, is, is pretty good. Most people put it at 15. So, I mean, it's all up to preference, up to you. Um, you can change this to 15, 30 minutes, or one hour, however you like. I'm gonna switch that to 15. Um, and the shorter time that you save it, the more memory it takes. Like I said, Photoshop is a memory whore. All right, so let's move on to export. So, you can put your copyright and contact info and set that up and I will go over um, how to set up the metadata. I'll make a note of that. Um, so the metadata is basically anytime you have a file or a document that you, you save or you create, it has metadata. It's information inside. It's inside the document. So sometimes when you right click on a document, let me go ahead and show you that really Okay, so I'm out of the desktop, and if you right click on this document, it's untitled, it's something that we just created, um, you go to the properties panel, and if you go to details, it has, it says I'm the owner, the computer, and whatnot, so that's how you know who owns the document when you save it out. Um, all that information is saved in, into this particular metadata. So. Um, you can put your company information and stuff like that. And that really helps for people stealing photos and whatnot. So you basically put your digital signature and that's basically what metadata is. It's information about the file and about the owner and basically copyright information. Same thing is done with software. 
Um, so you can do it with photos too, and a lot of people don't know that. So these are just preferences. You can do a quick export format. Um, you can choose whatever you like. I usually save ping formats, so I've, I've saved it out as, as that. And um, you want to convert to RSRGB, which is basically the color profile that's within my monitor, so that way um, it's printing properly. Now, if you have a new updated um, monitor, they have the Adobe, 9, um, Adobe RGB, um, and that's the upgraded version of the Asus, but there's really not much difference in that. And I find these monitors to be perfectly acceptable. Um, also, the upgraded ones have 32 inch and really wouldn't fit on my desktop. So just keep that in mind. If you're working in a budget, this will work just as fine. Just make sure you check that box. All right, so if you wanna work in a smaller file, you can check that box too. I usually work in the 8-bit. You can work in the 16-bit, like I said. Um, you're not going to have access to some actions and you're not going to be able to use the, the filters. Um, there's certain things that you can't use with anything above 8-bit. The performance. So <laughs> what I said about, um, you know, the whole specifications, let me show you this. Okay, remember when I told you that you needed a really good system in order to run Photoshop? check this out. So you see my available RAM is 29941. So that's my my memory, okay? Photoshop is I have it using about and and like kind of like 60%, but most of the times I run into where I have to let Photoshop basically use all of it because it's so it's so intensive like when you're doing like really advanced edits. Now, you're a beginner, so you're probably not going to be a power user like me, but I'm just letting you know that if you're trying to do something really intense, it's not gonna work out for you if you don't have a good system. So I have a really good graphics card. I have the NVIDIA um, GeForce GTX 970. Um, and so if you go to the advanced settings here, um, it offers me to do the 30-bit display. Now, some people have even more advanced systems where it allows them to do 60-bit and so on. But um, I'm in the advanced. If you choose, like, if your if your um, Photoshop is running like slow, or it's if you have like a poor system, you can run it on basic or normal. Um, but basically what that does is that it will give you less colors, it will give you less performance, it will basically, um, your Photoshop will be running half-assed. I'm just going to be honest with you. I always run mine on advanced. Um, you don't have to have the 30-bit display um, checked, but um, a lot of times when I'm working on int intensive stuff and my computer slows down, I will just turn this off because it doesn't make much of a difference, but I digress. So you're gonna wanna have your cache level set at least two or higher. I have mine at a three. And then um, the cache tile size, um, you can, you know, I have mine at the second um, highest level. Um, and basically, it will tell you, it gives you the tooltips. If you hover over it, it will explain everything to you. So if you're not grasping this, you can read this on your own and when you set this up. So um, I have reverted to the old legacy um, comp compositing because I feel like the old composite engine works better you can switch this on and you can switch this off to see how it works for you. I personally like the old legacy um, composition, I mean compositing, sorry. So, um, so if you're unsure of what you need in this section, if you're doing web and UI design, it's going to tell you what you need. If you are doing default photos, it's going to tell you what you need here. And then if you're using huge pixel dimensions, which is what I use, it tells you that you need, this is what you need. So I've selected that and that's what I normally use. So um, 
that is how you set that up and that is basically explaining this whole interface here. Scratch disks. Okay, so scratch disks are basically when Photoshop uses up too much memory from the desktop or the hard drive, it wants other resources to use so that way it, continue, it can continue to perform well. So as you can see, I have several disks here that, and I allow it to use two additional disks so that way my um, system is running optimally so it, it crashes less. So yes, Photoshop uses a hell of a lot of resources. So usually when I'm running Photoshop, I don't have any other programs open because it's so intensive. So if you think that you're gonna run Photoshop and Illustrator and all of these other programs side by side, think again, because you will have some lag or you'll have some problems unless you can afford to buy a Mac, which like an $8,000 system. You're gonna need the same specs that you have in the PC, but a Mac, um, Macs tend to work a whole lot better than the PC. Unfortunately, I'm poor and this is what I can afford. So um, that I'm just being honest, okay? So you can change your scratch disks at any time. And um, if you wanna know more about scratch disks in detail, you can Google information about that or you can leave a comment below. I will try to answer any questions that you have about this interface. Cursors, this is so much fun. Um, a lot of times your brush cursor will disappear. You can make it reappear by hitting the space bar. Um, you can choose precise. Um, when you're drawing um, or painting or something like that, you want a precise. Um, normally, <clears throat> when I'm not drawing, I just use the normal brush tip. You can go back and forth with whatever you want. Now, um, sometimes the the brush tip will disappear. You can turn it on and off by pressing the caps. And then also um, something to do with this, the space bar. Um, sometimes I forget, but I know for sure that I use the caps, I turn it on and off, and sometimes the brush little thingy will disappear and you can make it reappear by hitting the caps lock. So that's one thing that some newbies don't know. Um, transparency and gamut. You can change this, but I leave this to the default settings. You can turn off completely. You can go to small, medium, light. Um, I just usually leave it at medium and I just leave it at light. You can change how that's set up and you can also do custom, but I really don't mess with that because I leave it the way it is because I like the way it is. All right, so units and rulers. Um, yeah, this is fun. So the rulers section is pretty important. Um, and I usually use my rulers in inches simply for the fact that um, when I measure things, I tend to measure in inches, not pixels. It depends, but if I'm working for with like web documents, I'll use pixels. Um, but normally I use inches because um, it's really hard to measure things with, in, in my opinion, pixels. I like to measure them with inches. So um, especially for print, but for web, um, you can use um, pixels. Um, and so you can set up your print resolution document, the default settings to 300 or the screen resolution to 72. And then the columns, I never really mess with this. I actually have an external program um, called Guide Guide, and it basically creates all of my measurements and um, guides and stuff like that. And I will go over Guide Guide with you. It's actually on my blog for free. You can download it for free. Um, so I will basically go over that when we get into um, farther into Photoshop so we can learn how to measure things and set up the documents properly. So you can leave these settings to the way that they are. Guides, grids, and slices. These are basically um, just a preference. You can set these up with different colors and you know different things. I don't really um, mess with this. Um, I don't really work with slices or anything like that because I don't work with 
I don't I don't create like Photoshop um, websites or anything like that. So um, plugins, um, you can actually um, enable the generator or enable remote connections. Um, it's going to give you some personal information here. I'm actually going to blur out my IP address and stuff like that. So um, this is just basically personal information for loading your extensions in Photoshop. You don't really need to mess with this. The, the type. So here is a very good clue here. And I also wanted to go back to units and rulers because I, I barely brushed over the type. So the type, you always want to keep it on points, um, or you can do pixels. You can do pixels or points depending on what you're doing. If you're going for the web, um, points. If you're doing for, for um, if you're like creating fonts or stuff, you want to do pixels. So um, going back to type. So, so um, in the type, the type tools panel, and I'll go ahead and bring that over, okay? I'm gonna bring it over here. And it won't let me do that because I have this dialog box open, but this is going to display the number of recent fonts. So you can bump this up to 30 or however many you want. I think I'm just gonna do 20. And it basically at the very top of the list, it will show you the last 20 fonts you used, which is a very useful. And a lot of this has to do with you smart quotes, enable missing glyph protection, show fonts names in English, um, use the escape key to commit text, uh, enable type layer glyph alternates, fill in new type layers with placeholder text. I'm gonna check that off because I find that really annoying. Um, so basically when you create a new type layer, it will automatically fill it in with some like weird lipsum dip some some kind of like weird um, language um, I think there's like a specific term for it I can't pronounce it but you know what I'm talking about right it's some like weird jumbled language and it automatically fills it in and sometimes it's annoying because it will when you're trying to type something it will just pop up there's sometimes a delay so you want to uncheck that unless you want a whole bunch of like default text where you need to fill in something and you don't really want to write a whole paragraph you just want to see how it looks so you can check that or not check it totally up to you 3d um because my computer like i said my computer barely meets the specs for 3d i have everything set to the max so um, you definitely want to have a really strong um, system if you're gonna be doing 3D. Um, my computer has some really high specs and it barely meets the specs. Like I said, if I was gonna buy a computer today, I would go above the expectations a little bit because you always want to um, buy your computer for future use, not for just today, but for make sure that it lasts three to five years down the road. So, um, yeah, and we won't be getting into 3D, so you can just leave this whole section alone. We won't be getting into th um, 3D until we get into the advanced section because um, 3D editing in Photoshop is a super advanced type thing. It's going to be complicated. If you don't know the basics, you don't even want to step into 3D. Um, technology previews. Um, so this um, section... Okay, let's talk about this panel. So the use modifier keys palette is basically for like touch screens for Windows and it allows you to create a basically um, to preserve um, shortcuts of most recently used, um, you know, items in Photoshop, like your menus and whatnot. Um, because we don't have a touch screen and I do not, and I'm telling you, I do not whatsoever, ever recommend you getting a touch screen tablet. I'm not, not a tablet, but a laptop or, or desktop monitor. Do not do that. It is horrible for design and the, and the screens, they crack internally. 
and I bought one and I had a really bad experience. It had lines through it. It broke internally. I never dropped it. I never, I had it for like three days. It was the slowest, poorest performing computer and it had some, it had some really great specs, but it was just trash and the technology just isn't there. So whatever you do, never, ever, ever buy a touchscreen monitor on your laptop or, um, you know, desktop. The exception is a Surface Pro tablet or an iPad. I've never used a Surface Pro. I've used an iPad Pro and I can tell you the technology is there for that, but not for laptops or desktops. Do not ever, I can't even stress enough, never ever ever buy a touch screen and do not buy a touch screen Wacom. You will regret it. I'm just, I'm forewarning you. All right, so um, enable preserve details. Um, so with this, if you have this selected, there's an option and we'll get to that later. It allows you to use as an artificial technology to basically um, increase the size or double the size of your um, image without losing quality. It basically preserves the details. So let's say for instance, you had a document that was um, 10 by 10 inches, like 3000 by 3000 pixels. It will allow you to go up to 6000 by 6000 pixels um, 20 by 20 inch, it will double the size and preserve the details. That can be quite useful. Um, so if you want to check that, you can. So if you press OK, what will happen is, is that the changes will take effect immediately after you, you know, close and reopen Photoshop. So I'm going to press OK. And then um, you can just exit Photoshop. So now we have Photoshop back open and I was just writing some notes there, um, don't worry. So and now we have all of our preferences set up. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the color settings. Remember when I told you that my monitor was set up to sRGB? So it already has the color profile, but if you're having color issues, you can actually go in here and change these settings. Um, to fix color issues if you're having color issues. But we're not going to mess with that. Um, that's why I said it's very important to have your monitor pre-calibrated and have everything you know set up automatically so that way you don't run into issues. Um, but you can mess around with them if you know what you're doing. So um, moving on. So what we're going to do now is we're going to create file and we're going to create a new document and we're just going to leave it like so and I'm basically going to um, go over um, let's see here file new I'm just going to do photos so that way it doesn't have that weird artboard thing going on so what we're going to do is we're going to set up our workspaces so when you come here you can create your own workspace so you go to window workspace and I have just different ones set up here. Um, you can set up essentials, the default settings, and basically you'll get all of these windows that will pop up here um, like so. And because I'm working with two screens, some of the stuff popped up on the other screen. So um, you can set these up however you like. Um, I personally, um, I go in here and I turn off all of these and these and you just go in here and turn them all off and then you can bring them back one by one and create your own um, basically your own um, workspace but we're probably going to be working and essentials but what you do is once you 
um, lay out everything. You can save your tools. Like a lot of people say, like, where's my brushes? How come they don't load back in? How come I have to load my brushes every single time? And that's because um, they're not saving the tools to their workspace. So let's say if you're working with a whole bunch of brushes and you wanted to save those brushes and you wanted to save those styles into a specific workspace because you're working on a particular, you know, file that needed like certain colors. Like right now I'm working on this particular um, package and I have these swatches and I have all these brushes that I need to load. So I created a new workspace called Pueblo. And when Pueblo loads, it loads everything from what I'm working on. So I have all of these styles and swatches that pop up, um, special, everything that's special here um, to what I'm working on. And then um, if I change it to workspace um, to 2.0, it will change to and I'm sorry, I have two screens, so when I was working last and I saved this, I had all of these out on the desktop. So what you can do is you can just basically snap these in wherever you like, um, kind of like organize things around, and you can attach these together to give you some more room, and they just snap together. Um, I'm gonna place this one over here. So if you hover over to the side, you can usually snap it over here. Probably because I'm screen recording, it's probably gonna be acting funny, but you can usually snap them over to the side um, and they will also attach to other sides too as well. But as you can see, it's overlapping my workspace. So a lot of times I don't like to work with all of my tools. I like to work them with them on the second screen. That's why, I highly recommend you getting a second um, monitor. So um, you can also change the the way that your screen is uh, set up. So what I mean by that is you can tile everything vertically. Um, you can create like a fake second screen, which is your work will be here and then you can tile all your tools on this side but it will only give you half a monitor to work with and sometimes it's hard. Um, you can tile them horizontally like so. Um, I don't really like that, but you can do two up and you know, you can just go through all of these. You can consolidate all the tabs back to the way, the way they were. I prefer working this way, um, you know, as far as like screens go. And then you can also with this. Now, I personally feel like this should be under arrange workspace, but actually it's under view. And that can be sometimes confusing to newbies because it's kind of like out of place. So what I mean by that is that you can basically change the screen mode to full screen mode um, with menu bar or you can go to view um, screen mode with full screen mode and then to get out of full screen mode um, you just press the escape bar and so the full screen mode is really great when you're working on a project and you want to put all you can put all your toolbars on another um, screen and you can work in full mode so it, that's I really enjoy doing that so um, and then you can you can also increase to 100%. So at the bottom of your document, it will tell you um, what size your screen is and if it's zoomed in to 100%. So if we go to the tools menu and we click on the arrow and we zoom in, we can see now at the very bottom here, I don't know if you can see it, I'm pointing my arrow over it, we're at 200%. So you can reset your windows to fit and you can do scrubby zoom or you can fill the screen 
or fit to screen or just do 100%. So that way you're always working in 100% zoom. A lot of times people will, will, will be accidentally working in 25% and then when they go to save their document, it looks kind of funny. So you want to work in the, the correct view mode. Um, you can zoom in, zoom out. You can also zoom in and zoom out by hitting the control plus and the control minus. But that's where you view your different. So it's very important to learn how to work your way around the menus because if you don't know how to do this stuff, it's going to make it really difficult. Now, if you want to move around the document, you're going to press the space bar and it's going to give you this little hand tool. And if you don't remember that shortcut, um, you can always come here and go to the hand tool. So the space bar is the hand tool. And what I mean by that, if we zoom in and let's just draw something really quickly. And then we take the space bar, we can move around the document like so. Um, so that's really cool. And um, so that is it for the interface. So now that we've set up Photoshop, we should be good to go. You should have everything that you need to use Photoshop properly. Let's go over some of the troubleshooting steps. Now I did mention one troubleshooting step, but there's a, a few more that you're definitely going to want to know in case you run into problems. One of the things that you can do is if you find that you know, you've messed something up or something's not working right. What you're going to is you can purge and basically it's going to purge everything. Sometimes, like I said, uh, Photoshop is a memory hog. So um, sometimes it can, it can get congested so you can purge it all. And if you click that, uh, it says it can't be undone and then you know, you only want to do that if you have a problem though. And then another thing is, is if you, if you're working on an image and you're basically doing a hard edit, and what I mean by a hard edit is that you're not creating a new layer, you're not doing a proper layer mass, you're just basically drawing over your photo or maybe you accidentally drew over your photo the original what you can do is you can go to file revert and as long as you didn't save the the content over it it will revert it back to the original so that's very important um sometimes i will be doing stuff and <laughs> I will have used all my control Z's and I didn't realize that I didn't create a new layer. It happens sometimes. You can revert back to the beginning. That is basically it for troubleshooting. If you run into bugs and stuff with Photoshop, I find that most of the time you will get an error in Photoshop. And then if you Google that error, usually you will find a solution either on YouTube for the error or on Adobe itself. So if you ever have an error or something like that, um, I could possibly help you with, um, you know, that error and um, try to troubleshoot with you and help you with that. But if all else fails, um, you can reset Photoshop back to its original settings. Um, probably the best way to fix any bugs is reset preferences on quit, you know, restart Photoshop and then start it again and then go in and put your settings again. Um, with that being said, sometimes with new updates you will run into bugs and you can always revert to the old version of Photoshop and I will show you how to do that. So if you go back to the Adobe Creative Cloud and you go into Photoshop, you can uninstall and then choose other versions of Photoshop. So if you upgraded to the new 2020 version and you have a bug, which we did recently, I actually had to revert back to 2019 for a bit until this new recent update. 
So um, you can always roll Photoshop back to the previous setting. So that is pretty much it for um, this um, particular intro model. So basically now that you have mastered how to set up Photoshop and know the proper tools and resources that you need to be successful in um, Photoshop, we're gonna go through all of the rest of the beginner courses and then we're gonna move on to more advanced skills so you can create something like I did on the right here, which I made this beautiful mermaid composite and we're gonna do this together and all of the tools and resources are going to be free with that. Um, this is gonna be so much fun. You're gonna be able to master Photoshop. You're gonna be able to go from beginner to pro. Um, you're gonna start from the beginning or start at any level really that you want. The videos are gonna be added weekly. Like I said, I'm gonna start the beginner course. This is just the beginning. And then we're gonna have four levels to these modules. All of this is free, all the resources are free. Um, and all the, all the courses for each skill level um, will be saved into a YouTube playlist, like I said in the beginning, where you can watch on autoplay. So this is very convenient and, you know, a very beneficial. I do want to let you know that you should take notes and keep a journal. Um, Photoshop is a massive program and I don't expect you to learn it all in one day. Um, gosh, I'm still learning and I'm 20 years into it. So um, the best way to retain information I found is to keep a little notebook and write down important details and information that you don't wanna forget so you can reference back to it. And eventually, over time, you won't need your notebook and you'll be able to retain everything that you've learned. So that's just a quick tip from how I learned Photoshop so quickly. Um, make sure that you subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you will always have access to these free Photoshop tutorials in case you forget or maybe you might forget a resource so that way you will always have access. And you will also be first in line to have the new free videos. And I just wanna thank you guys for supporting this channel um, so that way that I'm able to bring you more free useful educational content in the future. Um, we're also gonna be doing um, suggestive videos as well. So if there's something that you don't know in Photoshop, if something I can help you with, let me know, leave some comments down below. Um, I'm sorry that this is a really long video, but um, it's very essential. Um, a lot of the things that um, people aren't telling, you know, guys like you out there, um, some of this stuff is really important. I feel like it's really skipped over in the beginning. And I think that you'll be more successful in Photoshop if you watch this whole video into its entirety. Thank you so much for watching guys and have a great day.